for the last portion of this panel, I had um, invited um, alumni to campus and uh, to talk about their military um, service experience and their Dartmouth education. And uh, I had the um, I've had the pleasure to teach two of these people, um, and um, s it's been a long day, so the, the plan at this time is that we will have opening preliminary remarks from each of the speakers, and then we're going to throw it open to discussion and uh, hopefully a broader discussion of military service at this moment. Uh, and I first... Um, when I took Don Pisa's email out of my trash, in the email trash, and reread it again, I thought, okay, who would I invite? I'd invite Stony Portis. Um, Major Stony Portis uh, read Homer with me in a community book group, um, and I knew uh, very quickly that uh, he was um, a force to be reckoned with. He graduated from West Point in 2004 and received his Master's of Arts in Liberal Studies from Dartmouth in 2013. He was deployed to Iraq, Afghanistan, the Philippines, and Korea. As a company commander, he and his cavalry troop were featured in Jake Tapper's Dartmouth 91 book, The Outpost, an untold story of American valor, which recounts the 2009 battle in which Stoney's outpost and his soldiers were surrounded and nearly overrun by more than 300 Taliban fighters. Um, and Stoney described some of that battle one night in book group. And um, so I've read the pages of Jake Tapper's book that talk about Stoney here in the index. Um, Stoney had taught courses in literature and cultural studies at West Point and is currently completing his PhD in English at Duke University. Uh, with a dissertation that looks at world literatures of war. And he's recently selected for promotion to Lieutenant Colonel. Um, so I'm glad he can join us today. Nate Fick took Roman history with me. And um, I'm sure that's major career. After graduating. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not laughing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> After graduating with a classics degree uh, from Dartmouth in 1999, Nate served as a Marine infantry officer, including combat tours in Afghanistan in 2001 to 2002 and Iraq in 2003. Um, and his book, One Bullet Away, um, is, uh, is, is necessary reading. Um, he led a cybersecurity software company for seven years and is currently a Dartmouth trustee. And he was, again, um, quickly on my list of people to invite uh, whose um, words I wanted to hear. Um, if you notice, this panel today has been voices that I wanted to hear from, um, uh, faculty, students, and now, and now alumni. Ron, Ron Buka is Special Forces Green Beret with multiple combat deployments in, to the Middle East and Africa. He has served with the 5th and is currently with the 20th Special Forces Group. He enlisted in the US Army following the events of 9-11 and the loss of his father. Um, Ron holds a BSM in finance from Tulane, an MA uh, mouse program in globalization from Dartmouth College, and an MBA from Columbia Business School. And he has just returned from a deployment. And so I invited the three of them to talk about their Dartmouth education and their military service in contemporary conflicts. And I now get to listen. Please, Stoney. Thanks, Roberta. <clears throat> well, um, you know, I'm, I'm working on my dissertation right now at Duke. And so what I found is that um, I've got so many ideas floating around my head that if I don't write them down, I forget them. So if you'll excuse me for referring to this. I, uh, I had deployed to Iraq in 2006, 7, and 8, and to Afghanistan in 2009 and 10 by the time that I had arrived here in 2011. 
And when I uh, had gone through those five deployment years, um, I arrived here with a full head of hair. And <laughs> I left with the haircut that you currently see, uh, thanks to Professor Pease. So, <laughs> um, you know, so I asked uh, Roberta, I, I think it was yesterday or the day before via email, I just said, hey, I was thinking I would wear my uniform, but I've packed a suit and tie as well. Uh, do you have a preference on what I should wear? And uh, she answered the question exactly how I would expect a, a, a very deeply thinking uh, professor of classics to answer the question. And she said, well, what would be most comfortable for you to wear on Veterans Day? Uh, I never would have thought about it before. This is still her in her email. I'm paraphrasing. I never would have thought about it before, but I suppose you have to navigate these twin identities all the time. And so I appreciated the email and I thought about it. And as I was walking over here this morning in my suit, I was talking to Allison, um, my wife, and I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wear my civilian clothes for the first half of the day. I'll wear it through lunch. And then I'm going to go to the hotel and I'm going to change into my uniform and wear my uniform for the second half to see what happens. Right? Now, that's not to degrade the uniform. It's, it's not to say that this is an experiment or that this is a gimmick, if you will, because it's, it's not. Um, it's instead to maybe give me an opportunity to reflect on what that really means to navigate those two identities. And what I'll tell you is that when I walked over here, I was much warmer and much more comfortable in the civilian attire than I am now. And there's some elements of that discomfort that are both literal and figurative. Um, for example, uh, no one seemed to notice me when I was walking here uh, this morning in my uh, suit and tie. And, uh, you know, Allie and I stopped at Starbucks and we got coffee and we came up here. Um, whereas when I was in this, I noticed heads turning, all right? And that's, that's probably an obvious. Um, I, I certainly got a couple thank you for, for your services out there. I got offered a cup of coffee. And uh, my favorite was I had to go back up to my room real quick to get my wallet before I left. And uh, Ali can verify that this is true. I was in the elevator and a coach comes in from a, a visiting basketball team and he says, oh, third floor, please. Uh, <laughs> and he was, he was entirely serious uh, until I pressed the third floor. Um, <laughs> And then by the time we got up there, I think it dawned on him, oh gosh, those are tanks on his <laughs> uniform. Uh, and he said, thank you for what you do. Thank you for doing I was like, I didn't know if he meant for the elevator ride or for my <laughs> service, but you're welcome and it's an honor. Um, you know, but thinking about navigating those, those twin identities, I, I, for me, is, that's, that's what the Dartmouth experience and the Dartmouth education really prepared me for. Um, and what I'll tell you is, earlier there was a conversation about the uh, uh, split or gap that occurred uh, in, during the Vietnam War era uh, f between Dartmouth and the military. And, and I had a completely different experience when I came. In fact, when I was accepted to Dartmouth, uh, the Army had a cap on what they would fund my education for. And, and they said, you know, well, we cannot pay above this line and Dartmouth is above it. And uh, so I, I called Professor Pease and I said, sir, thank you so much for accepting me to a program. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to attend. He said, well, why not? Well, um, this is the cap and the Army can't pay above that. And he said, don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. And n not only did he, you know, he personally work to reduce you know, my tuition rate to meet that cap, but he reduced it well, be well below the cap. And so uh, that that people like Professor Pease are still getting personally involved with uh, students that, that uh, you know, they see promise in. Uh, I'm, I'm very grateful for that, sir, and for, for that first impression, but then also for the uh, impression that you uh, beat into my head uh, over the course of the following two years with the numerous uh, uh, books and classes that we took together, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm very grateful. And so when I think about those there's three educational experiences. The first and foremost is the MAUS program. Um, so the Master's of Arts and Literal Sub Studies program, for me, I, I was going to teach literature at West Point after that, and, I, and I've since gone and left. And um, so for me, I focused in cultural studies and doing that and, and exposing me not only to uh, 
a set of literature that was both wide and deep in how it gave me a vocabulary not only to talk about my military experience in my service, but also think about what that means for me as an individual, and, and perhaps even if I could intuit what my own identity is. Um, well, that's, that's what I would call is the, the, the liberalization of the mind that you're looking for, sir. And, and so I took that experience to me as I taught uh, uh, literature at West Point. I took that experience as I taught uh, pop cultural studies courses for my, uh, the battalion that I was the chief of staff of at Fort Lewis, Washington, before we went off to the Philippines and to Korea and to Thailand. And so, um, you know, call it the gift that keeps on giving, but I think that, that that's why we, we ask for ROTC programs to come, or we ask for veterans to come and be students is not because um, we're trying to militarize, I may be taking a quote from, from you here, we're not trying to militarize uh, the campus, we're trying to liberalize the military. Um, and, and I think that's a good thing, right? Uh, as secondly is that, um, the second education is, is this reading group that you know, I stumbled into, I think at the time, uh, I hadn't met Ron yet, so uh, and I didn't really have a peer out, out there in, in campus that had had that same experience that I had, and I saw a, a pamphlet and a flyer for uh, your reading group that was meeting down at the public library. And so I stumbled in there, and it was into a room full of World War II, Korea, and Vietnam veterans. And they were like, what is this punk doing in there? And I walked <laughs> in with like, my tweed jacket and my flat cap, and, and uh, they thought I was just probably some snot-nosed kid. And, and then they gave me the opportunity to just sit and listen to them and to, to be a part of that chorus of voices and, and share in our experiences and interpret those experiences and the challenges of coming home by thinking about the same challenges that Odysseus faced when he tried to transverse between uh, Scylla and Charybdis, right? And so uh, I think what, what really surprised me most near the end of that experience, uh, Roberta, was when uh, Jake Tapper was here with his book release tour of The Outpost telling that story, and I was there kind of as part of that, and um, you and the entire group showed up. Uh, and, and it wasn't necessarily because they wanted to hear the story. I think, it, for me, I felt like because they were there to support me. And so there was that, there was that, that peer support that I don't think I, I, I would have experienced anywhere else that I've carried with me through my current studies of Homer and what it means for coming home uh, for the American military veteran, which maybe we can get to during the conversation. And then, th then last is just the greater community uh, with, with people like uh, Nathaniel Fick and, and Ron Booker and the other student veteran organizations, whether it was the Dartmouth undergraduate veterans or you know, the Tux organization. And that um, it is through the civic-minded approach that there's also a different kind of education that extends well beyond the uniform and well beyond when we take this off. And so carrying that with me as well. But I think I'm well beyond my allotted five or 10 minutes, so I'll, I'll pass the mic. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Stony. That's a it's a, always a hard and insightful act to follow. Um, Roberta, thank you for pulling this together and for the invitation. And uh, it's a real it's a real treat for me to be here today with um, back at Dartmouth and in in the same room as two of my professors from. Uh, it's been more than 20 years now, I'm sorry to say. So, uh, but it's, it's a real honor to be here with you. Uh, I guess I wanted to make just a couple of points uh, and make them fairly quickly since I think uh, the, most, uh, the most compelling parts of these things is always the discussion in the room. Um, I, but before I, I make my two points, let me just say I, I really identify with what Stoney said about this, this sort of tug of which, which world do I belong in and uh, I think, I think many of us feel that even after we're out for good. Um, and I feel it most acutely of all places in the departure lounge at airports, where one of the many little acts of uh, kind of societal contrition for uh, having ignored um, what our military has been doing for a couple of decades is uh, allowing military members to board the plane first. And it, it just, my blood pressure goes up every single day time when I'm standing there anonymously, you know, as a, as a dude in jeans or a business guy in a suit, 
and uh, I watch, you know, the mother traveling alone with small children, and I and I see the, uh, you know, the the older person maybe with a walker, uh, and there go a couple of you know 18-year-old buck privates hopping on the plane first, and it just it just pisses me off every time. <laughs> and um, so navigating that kind of you know betwixt and between is hard. Um, so the, the, two, the two things uh, that I, I would offer just by way of personal perspective. One, um, I was at Dartmouth as an undergraduate in the peacetime 90s. And uh, uh, it, it, I don't think it's that, you know, we as a community thought well of military service or thought illy of military service. I just think we didn't think about it. Um, it wasn't really on the radar at that time. You know, Bill Clinton was in the White House and the tech economy was booming and, um, you know, 9-11 was effectively unimaginable. Um, and, and so, I, you know, I, I joined a peacetime military in the 1990s and it was sort of a, a little bit of a lark, right? I, I didn't, I didn't want to, um, you know, and, and President Hanlon's here, which, which I really appreciate, thank you, and something that, you know, I, I think we've spent time on um, I know we've done it as a board, and, and I know we've done it in other parts of this community, but people come into Dartmouth, first-year students come into Dartmouth with a thousand interests, and too many of them leave on four tracks, right? There's this funneling effect into investment banking and management consulting and medical school and law school. Um, and uh, if you really want to do one of those four things, great, more power to you. But if you're just defaulting to it because it's easy, then I think we need to combat that. And so in the 90s, we, didn't, we just didn't think about military service. And so uh, I didn't want to do one of those four things. Um, I frankly probably wasn't creative enough or uh, bold enough to cut my own path in some other way. Um, and, and the military felt like an interesting way to uh, pursue some interests that I did have, like leadership, like the outdoors, like you know, almost like athletics. I mean, it was, it was a proxy for all these other things. And um, so I spent a couple of years in, as, a, as a, an infantry officer in the pre-9-11 peacetime military. Um, and then obviously it all changed and, you know, had a, had a, a very busy few years after that in the, in the combat military um, before uh, trying to reintegrate. Um, you know, I went to grad school and, and, and had a handful of jobs after grad school. And... Um, I think the, it, it's easy to maybe, um, I don't know, romanticize or pontificate about the, the value of a liberal arts education, even in a place like a combat infantry unit. Um, and most of the comparisons are maybe fair or overdrawn. Um, um, but uh, I, will, I will say that you know, a couple of things that, that really seems to matter. Um, my Marines were always hungry for information. It was sort of the adage that People will follow you through the gates of hell if you tell them why. And um, uh, being able to paint some context for people in those very fluid, uncertain, fast moving and frightening situations where, you know, you can say, hey guys, here's some of the, the threads behind what we're doing, you know, some of the why. And uh, I don't have all the answers, uh, but, but here's just a, a little bit more perspective um, to help us all understand what's going on here. I, I always found my Marines to be uh, both grateful for that and also really responsive to it. And um, so that, that's uh, you know, maybe, maybe one um, argument in favor of having an officer corps that has places like Dartmouth represented in it. Um, the, uh, the second thing that I, I, I wanted to say, um, just again by way of conversation starter, was uh, you know, pe people ask me all the time in, in the course of my current job, um, I went to business school after the Marines. People say, so what, what was it about business school that really equipped you for this, for you know, these kind of growth CEO roles? And I kind of look at them blankly because maybe I was a bad business school student, but I didn't pick up very much in business school. I, 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 uh, I got a little bit of a network, but there are other ways to do that. I picked up a vocabulary, but frankly could have read that in a book. The thing I really got from business school was when things in my business were cratering, I never laid in bed at night, looked at the ceiling and said, if I only had an MBA, I would know what to do. So I got that, you know, maybe um, whatever sense of self came from that. But, um, 
you know, I, I think that b building and running a business for me kind of takes me back to the things that you, that I learned at least as a, as a junior officer in the Marines. And, uh, you know, uh, the, the notion of galvanizing a team to do something hard and then, and then uh, keeping your head as things come apart because that's what, you know, that's what happens in life, things come apart. And, uh, um, you know, one of, the, one of the real distinctions that, that I think became apparent for me very viscerally was the difference between legal authority and moral authority. And, you know, you, you, look, at, you look at Major Portis in his uniform, right? And imagine if all of us had the equivalent of this, where our, our place in the organization sat on our collar and we had our resume stapled to the outside of our jacket. But that's what a military uniform is. There's a lot of moral authority vested in this uniform. And uh, people in the military respond to that. They really do. Uh, but they respond to it a lot more in peacetime than they do in combat. And, uh, you know, I'm guessing at the, at the uh, you know, both of these guys, I, I don't, I don't want to put words in anyone's mouth, but I'm, you'd be hard pressed, by the way, to find a pair of Dartmouth graduates uh, since Vietnam who have more close quarters firefight experience than these two. So um, this is, uh, this is uh, you know, a humbling place for me to sit. Um, but the difference between moral, legal and moral authority, it, it's very strong and vested in this, in this hierarchical institution, and it matters in peacetime, but it doesn't matter a whole lot in combat. Uh, what matters in combat is the moral authority. And the leaders to whom a lot of moral authority accrue uh, are the leaders who, in, in my experience, did two things. One, they knew their jobs, and two, they took care of the people in their charge. And if you know your job and you take care of your people, then you accrue a lot of moral authority. And um, that's the currency you're trading when the chips are down. And uh, um, I think that living that experience in the military is, an, is invaluable um, because too many people fall back on their title or uh, you know, their, their resume um, and the real capital that I think we're all spending in our human interactions certainly professionally and probably personally too, is that moral authority. And, and the, the heroes in life, in my experience, are the, somehow the people with no legal authority who get lots of moral authority, right? The young people, the junior people, the disenfranchised people who for whatever reason are really good and really take care of their, empathetic and take care of their teams, and they have an immense amount of moral authority. And the goats are the people who have all the legal authority but they just don't have the moral authority. And they're the one, we all know who they are, right? And uh, uh, so, you know, uh, life in a, in, a, in a combat unit uh, makes those distinctions very stark. So, thank you. Thank you. So, thank you, Roberta, you for having me. You have to go after here. those two. <laughs> I know, it's yeah, <laughs> tall order to fill. And thanks everyone for braving the snowstorm coming in here. Um, uh, as Roberta mentioned, my journey kind of begins with 9-11. I grew up very much kind of blue collar family. My father was a New York City firefighter. Um, he had served in Vietnam. My grandfather and uncles had served in World War II, Iwo Jima, uh, Battle of the Bulge. So I, I had a respect for the military, but it was never really in the plans. And then fast forward to 9-11, my father is a New York City firefighter that responds to the South Tower. Um, unfortunately, we lose him that day. I wind up working a little bit at Ground Zero before finishing college and then deciding to join the military. So a very visceral reaction to the events and to what I wanted to do and, and why I joined the military. And at that point, from then on, it was, you know, pedal to the metal, 100 miles per hour. Um, you know, both mentally and physically, becoming a Green Beret, serving in combat, multiple combat tours, and as these, and everyone, all the combat vets in the room can attest to, you know, it, it very much becomes about survivab survivability and getting through the next obstacle and the next obstacle. And you don't really get time to reflect or, or slow down. 
So we talked about Dartmouth being a bubble earlier with kind of a, a negative connotation, but for me it was very much positive. So fast forward to 2012 when I show up to Dartmouth um, and I'm, I'm forced to take a breath, right? I come off a, a combat tour to Iraq. At that time we had closed down the country for the first time, I guess. Um, and, uh, you know, I thought that chapter of my life had kind of closed and I show up here and, you know, the, the town essentially shuts down at 9 p.m., right? So you're, you're forced to kind of say, okay, I'm, I'm sitting here with myself, you know, like I have to kind of self-reflect and then, you know, I have to meet new people and interact. And for me, this was a positive bubble in the sense of, you've so much intellectual horsepower and, and just like academic vigor here that you can't find elsewhere. And it's aside from the hustle and bustle of Cambridge, of the city. And it allowed me to reconnect, to reconnect with society, to reconnect with myself, to reconnect, you know, with, with reading, quite honestly. The Army functions at, I think, an eighth grade reading level. So, you know, it was a little, little bit of a challenge, long nights in Baker Barry uh, to get those academic skills back up to, to par. Um, but I'll forever be grateful for Dartmouth and, and the opportunity allotted. So combat, I think, gave me the confidence to understand that I could go to a school like Dartmouth and I could meet the challenge that it presented, but it was Don Pease, the Mouse program, Jim Wright, that really afforded me the opportunity and helped me realize that it could happen. So, uh, yeah, that's pretty much why I'm so grateful to be here today. I would like us to have um, this uh, discussion. Now, if this were a War Stories class, we'd all have read the same text, so we could all riff on, on a particular text that we read. Um, but the hope was that we could actually have a discussion um, to end the day. And so I'm going to open it for any questions. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Oh, um, two hands. Vitalia. Oh, I think uh, I'll defer to. Defer, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, anyway, uh, and thanks to all of you for your service. And, and Sony, I had a full head of hair when I arrived here, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you've each spoken um, very powerfully about what benefit you derive from institutions that you belong to, Dartmouth in the military. Um, what we know today is that trust in institutions is eroding rapidly in this country, um, especially amongst the younger generation. Um, do you have any sense of why, um, given, given what you've taken away from institutions, and what, why might this be happening? Gentlemen? <laughs> yeah, I'll... Uh, uh, um, so I was walking through Harlem last week and there's some graffiti on the wall and it said, too many humans, not enough soul. And it kind of made me sit there and think about that. And Roberta and I were, were talking before this too. And, and I feel to some extent the civility has been taken away from the institutions, from the gathering and just, you can blame social media, just technology, current times, whatever you want to attribute that to, but we've lost this ability to humanize things and connect as people to include debate, like healthy debate, understanding people's different stances and opinions, and, and then being able to walk out of a room and, and not begrudgingly hold that against one another. Um, and, you know, I, I don't want to dwell on social media, but it, it tends to, to take away from the human aspect and we just no longer connect as people. And, and I think that's the beauty of a college campus, 
of the classroom and having that face-to-face -face time and, and being able to talk and interact. Um, and, you know, the, the accessibility of kind of virtual this and that and remote, ha it, it's phenomenal. It's, it's progressed us in a lot of ways, but I think it's, it's also taken away and, and we're feeling some of those after effects. I love I love that answer. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's incredible. I think the uh, one of one of the one of the few institutions that does retain some level of trust seems to be the military in poll after poll. And so, maybe my, the way I might try to attack that, Phil, would be why why is that, and what are the things about the military that that allow it to retain some degree of trust even among young people and. All made all the more remarkable by, you know, two decades of war, um, and yet still, you know, this institution has it, at least some amount of trust. Um, it, it was the it was the only truly diverse institution I've yet been a part of. Mm. I think, um, you know, actually, um, where uh, you know I came out of Dartmouth and and worked. F the three officers above me in my chain of command were all African-American, that, that wouldn't have happened at McKinsey or Goldman Sachs or the other places I could have gone out of here. Um, but diverse more, more meaningfully too, like more but politically diverse, socioeconomically diverse, just, just a real mixing pot. And uh, so I, I think somehow the, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about this great sift or sort that's happening in American society where people are even increasingly moving to zip codes that reflect their points of view um, the military still is is somehow uh, more broadly representative than and uh, and I, I think you know meritocratic um, and uh, I, I just I, I am hard pressed to identify institutions that uh, that are uh, that are genuinely that way thank you I don't think I can add anything to to either of those things, but what I will say is that um, you know there's a unique challenge uh, among maintaining that in the military right now, and it's twofold. The first is that um, roughly uh, of, of the military age eligible population in America, roughly 30% qualify uh, in, in terms of health, uh, prior drug abuse, uh, prior criminal uh, record uh, to even enlist in the Army or Navy or Force Marines. And so it, it's an interesting, I think it's an interesting problem from a different perspective, and that is that uh, while we might perceive that there is an eroding sense of trust uh, among institutions, I think concurrently we, these institutions are, at least for the military at least, are having a challenge of filling their roles. And I don't know that there's an answer to that. A, a sense that I have is, you know, General uh, Robert Abrams, uh, uh, who is commanding U.S. Forces Korea, recently made a call to all of the senior military leaders across all branches of the defense to get onto Twitter and to get onto Facebook or Instagram or social media. And his reasoning was because that's where our soldiers are. And if we want to have a conversation with them, then that's where we have to be. And so we recognized that there was too many senior leaders across the organization that just weren't having an organization. And so in an attempt to flatten it, uh, that's, that's what he thinks is, is probably the best move to make. And so I, I wonder how much of it is this that we are missing the opportunity for dialogue? I don't, I don't know. I'm just speculating. Thank you all very much for coming today. Thank you for your past service, your current service, and your future service. And Roberta, thank you very much for organizing this panel and for all the work that you do on behalf of our veterans. I'm struck by a certain tension that was revealed by um, President Hanlon's question about eroding trust in institution and a comment that was echoed from each one of you about the sort of separation between your military service and your civilian lives. And I'm wondering if that might not be the 
solution to this question about why the military retains some of the respect of society that so many of our other institutions don't, and that's a sense of being separate from uh, the rest of our lives, civilian society maybe not being so prevalent on social media, for example, um, and out there. And I'm wondering if you might um, talk a little bit more about that dichotomy in your own existence between being um, part of the armed forces and being part of the civilian society and the degree to which you like to keep that separation and the degree to which maybe you'd like to see it more integrated. I mean, I deal with it a lot uh, as still serving in the National Guard, um, you know, and, and working for a company in the civilian sector and then on the weekends or every couple of months I gotta throw on my military hat and then go deploy or, or I'm in charge of a special forces team. So two very kind of different worlds, if you will. Um, and it's a challenge, you know, it's, it's always, I am able to glean some of the things out as far as uh, what Nate talked about earlier, that, that sense of cohesion, being able to build out processes and procedures, building, being able to bring a team closer together. Um, I'm able to take that from combat, from the military side of the house, and I'm able to provide that to the civilian side of the house. But generally speaking, it, it comes down to different motivation and it's, it's really understanding the individuals. It's a lot more difficult for me on the civilian side to understand what motivates people. The Army makes it easy for me. It's, we're given a mission and, hey, we all have to achieve this common goal together or the mission fails or, you know, the risk is a lot higher. So it tends to bond people and bring them together. On the civilian sector, when, you know, someone's moti not motivated, but they're doing it for an hourly wage or maybe a salary, it becomes a lot more difficult and you have to draw on that, that empathy, that human connection. And, and really that's been the common bond between both worlds is, is just that drawing back to that skill set and empathy and, and being able to relate to people and, and getting them behind a common cause. Um, but you, you've probably faced it. I, uh, I did a video call for work a little while ago today, and uh, right at the outset of the call, one of the members of my team said, hey, Nate, why are you wearing a flower uh, about my poppy? And, uh, you know, it's like that kind of, you just got to do that kind of thing again and again and again, right? And, um, uh, but I, I, knowing Roberta, this is probably by design, but it's, it's interesting to me that we have, uh, we have in Stony. Uh, somebody still on active duty, you know, kind of two feet in the world. And then, Ron, you have kind of a One foot in each, yeah, yeah. right? And I got, I have two feet out. And, um, uh, and so we're, we represent that whole spectrum of experience. And, and I can just say from my, my, my sense of, of making that transition was, you know, every now and then you read something and, and, and uh, it resonates with you because it, it somehow crystallizes everything that's in your head, but you, you haven't found the words for it. And uh, Elliot Ackerman is, a, is a, uh, a Marine veteran who's turned novelist now. And I uh, actually went for a walk with Elliot 10 years ago when he was thinking about writing his first novel. And I put my arm around him very paternally and I said, well, young man, you know, writing fiction is hard. <laughs> so a National Book Award later, he's doing okay. <laughs> and, uh, um, so Elliot did an interview in the New York Times, uh, I think it was around Memorial Day this year, and he said that uh, one of, in his view, one of the unique and interesting things about this, these current wars is that they, don't, they haven't ended. Uh, you know, there, there's no end. And so for everybody who leaves, each of us has to make his or her own separate piece. Because it doesn't end. So at a certain point, you just have to say, that's enough for me. Um, you know, I'm out. And um, uh, because I mean, otherwise, other you're just you, you just you can only play the numbers for so long. You know, uh, eventually, at least in my experience, no, people's did. chip, you know, people's number comes up. And uh, 
Um, and so I found that, I found Elliot's observation really powerful that, uh, you know, each of us has to make his or her own separate piece. Um, but it's a, it's a great conversation topic here because again, like we're each in a very, we're in, we're in different yeah, uh, relationships well, with in. that world. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I don't know that I'm qualified to answer your question the, uh, since I'm still in. Uh, but there's a very, very closely related question, which is about um, the perception of a, of a gap between those of us who are civilians and those of us who are within the military. And there's, you know, there's how do we bridge that gap? And I think that you know, there's, there's a, lot of, uh, a lot of veterans out there who have now called attention to saying, thank you for your service, maybe isn't enough to bridge that gap. Uh, but what I will say on the, the side of still wearing the uniform is that there's, those of us also have a responsibility to explain what that service is like, what that, what that experience is like. And that can be done through the literary example, like you know, Eliot's uh, uh, work. Uh, but I think it, it also is importantly done just through the personal relationships that we build uh, throughout wherever we go in life. And so when I came here to Dartmouth, uh, I had this attempt to see how long I could go before my classmates realized I was in the military. Like, I wanted to hide it. Um, part of it was probably just to see if I could do it. But there was another part of it just because I, I wanted to see if I could survive without it. And I, and I think I lasted maybe, maybe three days. It wasn't, <laughs> wasn't long. Um, and it was because on the first day of class, uh, when the teacher asked a question, I stood up. <laughs> said my name, said where I was from, and then gave her an answer that finished with the words ma'am. And everybody was just like, well, oh my God, why is he standing? <laughs> um, you know, and, and that's, a, that's a true story, but, it, but it's also just an example of like, you know, I, I think we have a responsibility to explain a little bit of our culture and what our country's asked of us, because in an interview last week, Elliot made a really interesting comment about these forever wars, and he said, he posits that the reason why they're forever is because one, uh, it, because how we are funding them, mm. right? Uh, right. Uh, and then two is because we're doing it with an all volunteer force, and so there's no impetus to end them, that's correct. right? And that's not me say, making a political statement in uniform. Mm -hmm. that, that's me regurgitating what I think is, is uh, a, a very observant point. Um, and so, you know, I, I wonder about that conversation that, that we need to have on many echelons. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Vitalia. I've been doing the um, networking and recruitment thing recently and thank Dartmouth for facilitating how easy that can be sometimes with their name on your resume. Um, but I am noticing um, this trend of devaluing the humanities um, broadly, which makes having being a government and sociology major something you have to perpetually explain. Um, the idea that one can inform the other I love that question, and I, I'm happy to jump right in on that. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of an absolutist on this point, so that's my caveat right up front. I'm not, I am imbalanced in my answer to this, um, because I, I completely agree with what I think is the premise you're stating. Um, I, I've run a Silicon Valley technology company for seven years, uh, and I will tell you that too many of my peer CEOs are completely delusional 
about the effect of their product in our society. And I think it's because, partly because they not only lack that perspective themselves, but they devalue it in the teams that they build. And we're reaping the uh, sickening harvest of that bias. Um, so uh, organizations are made of humans, after all, right? And so I'm, I'm a huge proponent for um, the value of a humanity of, of the humanities in a liberal arts education writ large, even in the mo maybe sometimes especially in the most technical leadership jobs. Um, and one of the things that I'm really excited about here at Dartmouth is the pioneering position of this place in the whole concept of liberal engineering and fusing the two um, uh, two disciplines in a way that. I think is, I mean, I don't think it overstates it to say this is part of our salvation. If there's going to be a salvation for us, you know, it, with technology in our society, some of it's going to come from that fusion. So um, I really hope that the pendulum is swinging back and that people are beginning to see how this, uh, how this um, overfocus. Um, and, and under focus on the humanities is uh, is hurting all of us. If I could put a footnote, because the people who flew the t uh, the planes into the towers had advanced degrees. Education isn't the answer. They had advanced degrees, mm -hmm. but they weren't humanities degrees. Just just notice that mm -hmm. that that you can be very very smart and very tech savvy and very STEM savvy. But if you don't have empathy or haven't done that liberalizing, you can end up in a very dark place. And, and so I, I just have to put that out there. Um, please not agreement with me, because then I'll have moral authority. <laughs> <because> <laughs> 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 I agree. Thank you. <laughs> back and hit. So this is really kind of our generation was not, you know, I have no um, ability to present myself. I didn't learn how to present myself as a, as a soul, how to combat better. And I was sort of encouraged not to. Well, now it's not, you all don't have to, I presume now it's a little bit easier to. So how do you, how do you I just try to present myself as the best person I can, and if they happen to find out, which was rare, and they would think, well, he, he wasn't. I try to give them a different exposure, experience, but I think that's maybe when we lost some of that opportunity for the civilian military to put it divided in the ways. You know, the ones who didn't serve are the ones who had stayed at the moral high ground. Um, how do you, uh, how do you find, how, what's your ability to present yourself? How do you? you find ways to do it, or you just hope it happens, and uh, I guess I'm being a little... Well, if I, you can understand where, okay. where I come from. Yeah, yeah. Well, first, I'll just say, uh, I think our generation of service members, uh, beyond the dedicated attitude that we have as members of this society and nation for your service, uh, we have a particularly special debt of gratitude that we have, because it was your generations of veterans that really took a stand to change that. And so because of that, uh, and because of the, the difficult transitions that y'all may have made, and y'all certainly did make, um, you know, we've had soldiers, sailors, and airmen and Marines that have been able to return and not have to necessarily hide something that is uh, very much part of who they are, right? So I can't speak about the transition, but I, I'll just say thank you for that yeah thank you and you know my father served in Vietnam you served in Vietnam served as my role model as I entered the military and for what it's worth yeah I just want to say thank you and, and know that not just for me but for a lot of guys we thought back to the guys in Vietnam and every time we had a hard day 
we said, ah, but what about those guys? You know, what about the 173rd on, on that day in November? Um, so thank you for that. Uh, but yeah, it's, I just let it occur naturally. Uh, you know, I, some people it means something to, some people it doesn't mean something to when they find out you're a combat veteran and you know, it's, it's okay either way, you know? I just kind of have that, I know why I served and what I do and um, if that's a value to someone, you know, I, I thank them for thanking me um, or if I can share information with them to help kind of enlighten their perspective on it, I will. Um, and then if not, I just let it go, you know, and, and unfortunately you're always going to find kind of both sides of the fence where people don't appreciate it and people do appreciate it, so. Yeah, I mean, my, my perspective is the, uh, the, the Vietnam generation, um, experience of the Vietnam generation taught our society a lesson or maybe our society learned a lesson from it not to confuse the, the uh, policy makers and the implementers. Um, and I think that you know, we all have benefited from the fact that that lesson's been learned. Um, you know, but that said, I, I, yeah, I, I mean, to, to some extent, like the, the fact that each of us is sitting here, we, it's a part of our public identity. Um, but I, I sure don't leave with it ever. Um, I just find it more alienating than unifying somehow. So if you look at, at, at all the kind of sweep of what we've done today here, those early military actions had narratives that placed them and allowed people to see where they had been and what had happened and, and so on. It seems to me that one of the difficulties we have somewhere around uh, uh, maybe even the end of Korea, uh, but certainly in Vietnam, we began to lose a narrative sense. Uh, and and uh, recovering some kind of narrative, some kind of story of who we are and what we've been through together, it seems to me to really be the crucial issue. And I think that happens. You know, it's, it's very easy to talk about people today, young people today, that being athletic. I don't think that's really true. I see a lot of energy and passion. But I also see that it's very difficult for them to say, you know, I've come from here and I'm going here. There's some kind of storyline that, that, that carries me. Uh, and, and, and I think your program, what we're doing here today, to, to, to let you young people are doing here, is just reach in and start trying to tell these stories. And the telling these stories and creating some kind of a narrative for American life is, is really a very crucial. Absolutely. 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 It, it's just a value, again, you say, well, people don't have the values anymore. But, but the values are there, but they don't know how to make them move from one place to another. So I thank you for your program and all the other presentations. You've done kind of a great day to such a being late, so I don't know if it's addressed already, but it'd be great to hear the panel's thoughts on um, to your, your opinions on what technologies um, you see in the future that could transform the military, be it nutrition or robotics or wireless or anything. It'd be great to uh, just get your perspectives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know there is a hard push for virtual reality. Uh, that's becoming more and more prevalent, more realistic training for soldiers. Um, and then, you know, as far as drone technology, that's forever increasing. The, there tends to be a, a movement in DOD to becoming less risk adverse to the, the men and women on the ground. 
So the more they could implement drones or remote technology to take the place of combat versus sending actual troops, sailors, Marines in there, um, that's kind of what they've been pushing for in the last few years. And then nutrition, uh, always, I, I don't think you'll see a single one of us support uh, MREs. So we're, <laughs> we're uh, at least from the ground level, there's a grassroots movement to improve the nutrition in the military. Um, so it, anything I've said in this, uh, in, in, in this chair has, has been my own opinion, certainly not of the DOD. But what I'll tell you is that, uh, and, and I, may, I may be teeing it up for, uh, for Nate here, but what I'll tell you is there's been an immense amount of resources invested in how we fight cyber wars. Right? And, uh, and, and this is everything from uh, trying to envision cyber, cyber as, a, as an entire domain of warfare to creating branches within the Army and the Air Force and the Navy to fight cyber wars. Um, and I went to a, a lecture uh, by David Sanger uh, a, a few weeks ago, and it was an interesting conversation between him and Peter Fieber, who is a civil military relations professor out of Duke. And uh, they, they seemed to agree that their biggest concern, like if they had to pick one thing that kept them up at night, it was, something in, in the near future, it is what's going to happen with 5G? You know, and, 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 and what is this internet of things, what is the effect going to have if we have data that's potentially routed through China, as an example? Or if we have uh, you know, everything that's on the cloud and, and we as a military are connected to our own version of that. Um, and so I can't speak to the particulars of that, quite, quite, quite frankly, because I don't know them. But I will tell you that even as an infantry battalion executive officer, uh, which was my last assignment before uh, the PhD program that I'm currently in, uh, when we were doing our military decision making process, one of the things that we took into account was the cyber threat. Yeah, a couple, couple things uh, from my perspective, and Stoney alluded to it, but my, my business was a, was a cybersecurity software company. And uh, so I, I kind of marinated in that world for a long time. And so I, one observation in the cyber world and then, and then maybe one in the kinetic world, um, the cyber domain, all, uh, all, of our, all of us to some extent are becoming more and more reliant on, on digital stuff um, for everything, for, for our personal economics, for education, communication, and all the elements of human flourishing. And that, that increasingly digital, I mean, we're connecting a billion things to the internet globally every quarter. And that's not, that trend is accelerating, not decelerating. So um, it's more and more in, interwoven into all of our lives. And the, the currency in the digital domain, the reason it works for us so far is trust. There, there's a basic level of trust, right? In I, I trust that my uh, you know, bank balance today and my bank balance next week are going to be appropriately related, right? Um, uh, not many of us are sitting there balancing our checkbooks in a way that used to be the norm. And I can almost promise you, unfortunately, that everybody in this room has had money stolen out of their checking account uh, by uh, Eastern European criminal groups uh, or, or you know, Russian affiliated criminal groups. But our banks true us up without us knowing it, in order to maintain our trust in the system because they, they make a lot of money from online banking and they want us to remain online customers. So um, in my view, it's about, it's about maintaining that basic, basic level of trust. And there are all kinds of forces right now that are gonna, that are gonna degrade that trust. So you know, we've all heard about deep fakes, this idea that if eight or 10 minutes of video exists of you anywhere online, um, which is, you know, I think every professor in America and everybody involved in public life in some form and, you know, anybody who even has a home, you know, video that's on Facebook that others now see and can download. I mean, it's, it's pretty close to everybody in the connected world. Um, any one of us can have a video made of us saying or doing anything 
and it's going to be very hard to tell that it's not real. And what does that do to trust? So, um, so I think uh, I think we're 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 headed for you know an interesting evolution in the digital world. Uh, maybe one other example. I mean, I, you know, if you live in the Northeast, you're accustomed to the fall storms that slamming your power goes out for three days, and it just happens. Um, and it happens with everybody trying to get your power back on. Well, what about a world where now the dedicated, every dedicated resource of the Chinese military and government is committed to keeping your power off? I mean, think about how hard it is to restore it when everybody's aligned to getting it back and now throw in a major external actor who wants to keep it down. So, like, that's coming. It's all coming, um, in, in my view. Um, in the kinetic world, uh, I think it's uh, the, the, the thing that I, I'm on the outside looking in now, guys, and so you have yeah. more insight than I do. But the whole concept of global precision strike, the, the idea that, that, you can, that you can identify a target anywhere in the world and destroy that target with the push of a button from here without putting anybody's life at, at, at risk. You know, it's a combination of, of identity technologies, facial recognition and other things, coupled with um, you know, uh, uh, power and navigation advances and precision munitions and very small amounts of explosives where it's not a you know, it's, it's not a laser-guided bomb coming from an aircraft overhead or even a missile from a long distance. It's a, it's a charge the size of a dragonfly, and it's flying up somebody's nostril, right? Like, when, when all of those things, that whole chain gets put together, you live in a world where, you know, you can target anybody in the world um, at no cost. That's a, that's a really chilling world. So um, all of which maybe comes back to the humanities. <laughs> okay, I'm going to ask one of my questions. So, Nate, you um, one of the re one of the distinctive features of you um, on this three panel is that you began service before 9/11 mm -hmm. and continued after 9/11. Mm -hmm. And so, I'm curious if you perceived in the way people perceived you. And actually, I remember seeing you at um, Joel Malkin's induction and having attended, when I'm invited, watching officers be commissioned, mm -hmm. watching Brad Wolcott be commissioned at the DOC house that was maybe full of 30 people, 20 of which were Brad's family, mm -hmm. and then being in a building in the Black Center, in a room in the Black Center that was filled with people mm -hmm not all of whom were Joel Malkin's family because there was a very large Dartmouth community. So my question is, did you perceive at Dartmouth in the time, and maybe beyond Dartmouth as well, the perception of you and your decision to serve before 9-11, after 9-11, was there a change in attitudes that, mm. you, that you saw? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Uh, there was a huge difference, and um, I mean, it manifested itself in so many different ways. But I, uh, yeah, I was commissioned in Baker Library um, on the day of uh, on the day I graduated. Um, it was early in, um, uh, so I, yeah, it, it, I mean, look, nobody came. I was the only person in my class. Uh, no, that's not true. There were two of us. Um, there were just the two of us who, were, who, who joined the military in the class of 99, right out of school. Um, and it was kind of like I said in my opening remarks, it, it, it just wasn't, a, it wasn't pro or anti, it just wasn't on anybody's radar. People didn't think of it as something to do. It wasn't like on the menu, right? right? Um, and so it was people, you know, again, it was almost, it was, it was benign indifference. Uh, was, I maybe was how I would characterize it. It just it was okay, great, go do that, fine. Um, and and then and then it changed and it became. We went through this period where it felt like we overcompensated in a lot of ways, and it became, you know, heroic. Um, it shouldn't be heroic either. Yeah. It's. A, I think there's a healthy there's a healthy balance somewhere between those two those two points. Um, but I, you know, the the 
not, not only did I join before and then leave after 9-11, but I left the U.S. on a deployment in August of 01, a month before 9-11. And so I went to Afghanistan and Pakistan from overseas. So from, from you know, I, I left the United States a month before 9-11 happened and came back, uh, you know, the middle of the next year. And so missed, like, the whole transformation. I used to have a little card, just to illustrate the transition, I used to have a little card that, a DOD card that allowed me to carry a duffel bag of assault rifles onto commercial flights. And I would, like, have this clanking bag that I'd be <laughs> pushing up into the overhead compartment. That's the world I left and came back to a place that was hard to recognize. So much had changed, and it was so stark because it wasn't a gradual change for us. It was, it was a step function change because we left a month before and we came back almost a year after. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Question. What did they make you do with the assault rifles? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, now you have to, yeah, you gotta, pa you gotta package them up and ship them. Or put them on a military plane. Oh my goodness. It's probably a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> You critiqued the idea of the kind of this absolute blind patriotism that we're seeing in some areas in this country. Um, the idea that a veteran can have a complicated relationship with their service is something that I don't often hear discussed or acknowledge. Um, the idea that a critique of our activity abroad and locally, um, our priorities abroad and locally, um, is something I, I don't really hear veterans engaging with often. And I know that obviously all three of you have a value for the humanities again. Um, and so I know that you probably, in particular, are capable of critique. I know this is probably difficult for you. Um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm curious about um, how do we mitigate Okay. Uh, <laughs> that wasn't on the sheet. No, um, no, it's a great question. Um, for me, I think I'm still figuring it out, right? It's, uh, I'm kind of torn in, in the sense of what that means and, and how much say I have. And, you know, um, I think it's easier for me to focus on the team level, you know, this, this kind of micro level. And so when I look at what we do as, a, you know, I just deployed uh, late last year, you know, got back earlier this year. And, you know, it's a much different environment than when I deployed back in 03, 04, et cetera. And it's gotten more difficult and more complex over the years. And, and it comes down to the people I serve with and, you know, trying to find good in whatever community I'm embedded with. And I just tend to become focused on what am I going to do with that community to make it a better place when I leave? What am I going to do with the team to make us stronger and better? not just, you know, in the mission, but as individuals. Um, you know, I've talked a lot of my teammates into going back to, to college, going back to school, helping them find jobs, and, and helping them kind of with this transition period, because it kind of goes back to the earlier discussion of this forever war, where how do you find peace with that, and, and how do you separate with that? And, I know it's not a great answer, but I think I still struggle with that. And I still struggle with like where I stand on the whole thing and and what it means and you know what aspects I want to mitigate and what I want to keep and yeah, no, it's it's a difficult question. It's a good question. 
I, I mean, I think Let me it, know when you find like, out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, yeah, you're right. I can't. I, I'm not going to openly. Pub, I'm not going to openly and publicly uh, criticize the military on this. But I, but I I think it might be healthy to think of this problem in terms of a concrete issue instead of an abstract one. So I'll give you an example. Um, post traumatic stress and suicide among uh, Afghan and Iraq war veterans. It's a great one, right? Are we scared to hire veterans and to allow them into schools because they might just crack under the pressure and shoot up the campus? Or uh, do we have pity on them? And which is it, right? And, and I think that something that the military is, I don't think, I know something that the military has grappled with is this very topic of how do we change the climate to where it is okay to ask for help? How do we change the climate to where instead of saying you are weak because you are suffering from the trauma of war that we just put you through to saying, you know what? You are acting heroic right, right now by saying, I need to take a knee because that's what's going to be the best thing for me, for my unit, for my family, right? That's something we're grappling with. And I think we've done a tremendous job, as, as y'all have, have probably certainly seen, just with the number of, of uh, behavioral health providers that we've seen join the military service and plus up uh, deploying units. Um, but uh, by way of an example, I, I think that um, any time that a, a, a corpus of work speaks in unison about a topic, we should listen, right? And, and we are seeing that right now among military veteran writers, right? So just as a quick example, since 2014, these, these stats are a couple of months old because I haven't looked at it since then. Since 2013, there have been 64 works of fiction formally published about the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, 64. Of those works, 28 have been published by veterans of those wars. So, and, and this, this is not nonfiction, this is strict fiction, right? So of those 28, an overwhelming majority feature a main character that is struggling with suicide, suicidal ideation, suicidal thoughts, or completion, right? But the veteran writers, and some of those are active duty uh, writers as well, are grappling this with, th with this issue, I think not just because a publishing company would think that a story like that would sell, but because we as a nation are grappling with that same thing outside of the military as we are inside, right? There's over, you, over twice as high of a suicide rate among uh, 18 to 34 year old Americans who have served uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan than their civilian counterparts. Right? And we're seeing that same thing to grapple with, right? And so if I have a critique about what we've done, it's been about our culture. And we've got to, I think, accept the fact that the military is, is a very much a reflection of society, right? And so I don't think this is just endemic to the military, although it, it certainly has the, uh, the attributes where that's where it starts. Uh, so, so, you know, that's something I grapple with every day. And, and I think the, the insight is, that, okay, is, is she a hero or is she weak because she's asking for help? And, and I think that we have got to continue to work towards the direction of hero, or it's okay to ask for help, and you can still have a successful military career. Yeah, you're here. Um, so I heard I heard a kind of a kernel in your question about about politicization and and what do we do? Kind of what do we do about it? Um, and the starkest example in my mind isn't about foreign policy at all because hugely complex, multivariable, historical issues. The starkest example of this weird politicization in my mind is, uh, is um, these uh, stories of military leaders um, who are being charged with effectively war crimes. And the way that camps coalesce around this issue and um, you know, there, there are a couple of special forces NCOs I can think of. There's a SEAL chief, a couple of Marine recon guys who've all, who are all now, have all now been charged under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. And the thing that unites them all in my amateur outside in reading is they were all accused by their teammates, right? Like not by the liberal media, not by Hillary Clinton, they were accused by their teammates um, who surfaced this through the chain of command and said, hey, this guy's doing the wrong thing. Um, and uh, I, mean, I, I certainly, in my experience, witnessed, a, 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 it's hard, right, in, in these 
the life or death situations, people sometimes do the wrong thing and they need to be held accountable for it. That's what officers and NCOs do. And um, so the, the fact that the president intervenes and this large media machine gets behind these cases and, and somehow holds up these individuals as if they're, they're um, being attacked um, when like it all originated in their chain of command and with their teammates they served with who said, hey, this guy's behavior is not right. Um, I find that to be the starkest example of the weird yeah. politicization of what's happening. Um, and so what do we do about it? Uh, I, I, I don't think there's any, you know, a, a running joke in our line of work, old line of work, was uh, there aren't many silver bullet solutions to problems, but sometimes there's a thousand lead bullet solution. <laughs> um, let's say Everything. a thousand. Yeah. Am I allowed to make a joke like that, Robert? <laughs> um, the, uh, you know, one, one, of the, one of the thousand lead bullets in this case might be an organization like uh, one uh, called With Honor, um, which, which was started by uh, a guy named Rai Barkat. Dartmouth gave him an honorary degree a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, Rai started, I mean, it's essentially a centrist PAC uh, aimed at uh, supporting political campaigns by Republicans and Democrats who are veterans who sign a pledge essentially to work together across the aisle and try to return like mm -hmm. strength to the center of American politics. Um, I mean, I, I think it's a, you know, it's a, it's a noble undertaking. It's a worthy cause. Um, and I think, I think the work he's doing is great. So, I mean, it's, it's maybe one small tangible an answer to your question. That's good. Is Julie really still doing this? Oh, can I, Paula? Yeah. 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 Sorry, I'd just like to circle back um, to how you guys all talk about the influence of empathy and the humanities. And I think conversation was kind of empathy between those who are close to you, like between teammates, between um, those of you who lead, or if you intergenerational, like intergenerational empathy, like how do we connect to those who served before us. But I was wondering what you guys think about um, about international empathy and like how do you see the importance of empathy between like you as a soldier fighting on one side and then there's also other soldier fighting on the other side or how do you deal with that? Do you deal with that? What are your thoughts? Yeah, look, I have a tremendous amount of respect for the the people I've faced on the battlefield. You know, and and maybe not initially, but in time I've realized they have their own convictions, their own values, their own morals that drive them to do what they do. Um, you know, at the end of the day, everybody wants to be the good guy or, you know, the good person. Um, and it's just not that black and white, right? We operate in, in a gray area, but I will tell you this, like, empathy has gotten me further on the battlefield or in a war-torn country than, than a gun ever has. Being able to, you know, walk down the street and talk to that shopkeeper or talk to that family, it, it all boils down to the same kind of hierarchy of needs when you talk to people. It's, they want their children safe, they want a brighter future, they want them to be able to attend school safely, they want to be able to feed them. They want some type of stability, you know, in their life and, and shelter. And, you know, if you're able to relate to that, and, and better yet, if you're able to provide that, if you're able to build a hospital, if you're able to vaccinate kids, if you're able to build a well, um, that goes over a hundredfold. You know, they, they call it the fist in the heart, right? And and it's just so much better to open up the heart and try and get everybody on board moving towards a common goal. Um, so I'm a big advocate of it, um, but it's, it's not always that simple either. You know, it's challenging. So. I, one of the things that always gets me fired up is when a politician, and it's usually a politician, refers to our adversaries as cowards. And, uh, I would imagine maybe one thing the three of us share in common is um, 
We might, we might disagree. We might be on different sides, but they're not cowards. Um, and uh, so I, I, I do think there's a, yeah, an interesting element of commonality across that divide where there might be times when you have more in common with the person you're fighting against than you do with uh, some of the things you're ostensibly fighting for. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, just, just an observation. Yeah. Well said. I, I, I think that the stark future that you painted earlier uh, uh, with the dragonfly flying up the nose. Um. Yeah, sorry. It's fairly <laughs> really graphic. Uh, I was trying to make Yeah. Point. I've still got that vision in my mind. No, it's but really it's my words. Yeah. You know, I, 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 uh, I have a very, very hard time seeing uh, a future of war fighting that is one without the human element. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think that, uh, I mean, the most successful military leaders I've worked for are the ones that understood it was, a, like you already said, an organization made of people and they were empathetic, right? I mean, they cared that you had a family and that you were there at the office late and they made you go home, right? I mean, so I, I, I feel, I feel like the empathy question's a, a relevant one, whether we're talking about war fighting or not. I mean, it's just, you know, we're, all, we're all people. That's, that's, why I'm, that's why I'm a believer. That's why I'm studying in, in, in the literature at the moment. Great. Yes, please. Can you just pick up on that theme? Um, what do you think motivated our enemies on whatever battlefields you've been on? extremism, is it patriotism, or is it just you know, love of their comrades that, that caused them to, to fight as hard as they did? All the above. You know, I, I truly think it's it's the same, right? People are, are pretty much the same no matter where you go, and, and it's some of the same motivating factors. I will say usually there is a socioeconomic factor, at least in the recruiting element, for a lot of the extremist organizations. Um, just when people feel they have less options in life, they're more drawn to sacrificing themselves or, or doing more radical things. Not always, but in some cases. Yeah, you know, I think, I think you're right on there, Ron. I, I, um, I'm thinking about my 2006 and seven deployment to Iraq where we saw a huge drop in the amount of attacks that, that we saw in our area of operation north of Baghdad. Um, and it, it, and uh, much of it, this was before the Sunni reconciliation, but much of it was attributed to a microgrant program that we had created through counterinsurgency doctrine. And, and to be very, very general and top, you know, wave top, it was uh, how do we, you know, how do we get military age males from joining Al Qaeda and instead support the government? And it was, well, let's figure out a way to give them a job and give them a sense of purpose. And, and so that's where we funneled our efforts. Um, Clearly, it, it, there was challenges in making that a lasting solution, but in the very near future, it was a socioeconomic motivation. And, and so I think it's, it's seeing the, the human side of it and that, I mean, many times, you know, he or she is not given an, an alternative and this is what they have to do to get food on the table, to mm -hmm. keep the other guys from targeting them uh, and what have you. Yeah, I'd echo that. All, all of the above. Um, my, my experience, I mean, my experience was just a couple of soda straws, you know, Afghanistan early on uh, in the fall of 01, and then Iraq early on in the spring of 03. And uh, I remember having a conversation um, you know, in, in Afghanistan early on. It was a little, little cadre of hardcore Al Qaeda guys who tended not to be Afghan, right? They were foreigners. And then a large number of you know, Afghan Taliban who had a different set of aims. And uh, I had a conversation uh, through an interpreter one day with an Afghan farmer and asked if he'd seen any foreign fighters around. And he, and he looked at me and he said, you mean other than you? <laughs> 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 and I had to give it to him. Like, That's a good one. That's a good one. Um, and uh, so they had they were diff different aims. And then, and then Iraq in, in 03, you know, my experience was, uh, uh, by, by, you know, in, in, it was in April of 03 that the, the statues of Saddam came down and the Iraqi military was basically defeated. And then there was a pause and everybody was kind of waiting to see what would come next. Um, 
And what came next was a, was a vacuum, essentially. And, you know, the, the Iraqi army got disbanded and debaufification got pursued down to a pretty low level in the Iraqi government. And so you ended up with a bunch of disenfranchised young people on the streets with guns. And uh, it's a volatile, it's a volatile situation. And, and then by late summer, you know, the insurgency was in full bloom, but I don't think it was for or gain. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. I remember after, um, uh, after the battle that we'd been through, when, when my troop had been surrounded by all those Afghans and I, I lost eight soldiers in that battle, and 19 additional were wounded, and that's out of a, a, a cavalry troop with 72 soldiers. And um, I learned in months following that my superior, my battalion commander, was trying to uh, make peace with the head uh, f leader fighter that had organized that, that attack, and I was just infuriated. And uh, he was coincidentally, uh, you know, we had crossed paths because he had been a professor at West Point in the social sciences department. He goes, Stoney, how do you expect this to end if we're not mm -hmm. willing to make peace with our enemies? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty fair point. <laughs> so. That might be a good ending. <laughs> um, a better ending is a round of applause mm. followed by drinks and reception <laughs> <laughs> right outside. And, um, but let's start with a round of applause.